Let's get to our first guest tonight. Uh, we want to welcome from the top of the podium, Mr. 500, Timmy Lou Retton. Timmy, how are you this evening? I'm doing well, sir. I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm doing just fantastic. Uh, I know that you have a, a history with Huck, so I'm going to pass it on over to Huck to, to start off the program. Tim, what's going on, man? Hello. <laughs> hey, first of all, before we get into the, the meat and potatoes of the interview and stuff, um, for you know our listeners and our fans who are not familiar with, with Timmy Lou Redden, and I don't understand how anybody could be or could not be you know, familiar with you, uh, give us a brief synopsis of, of, of how you got into your business, uh, who were some of your role models when you were a child, who you look up to, and uh, who actually who actually trained you and brought you into the business. Well, I got into wrestling from my grandfather. I started watching wrestling at the age of four. He was a big Art Anderson fan, and every Saturday we watched wrestling together, and I first saw Art Anderson give the Spawn Buster, and I didn't really understand it, but I was like, up, down, that was cool. Um, growing up at the age, around age eight, I started doing gymnastics, and then I also started watching wrestling more and more by myself. The match that made me want to be a wrestler, it was between Lord Steven Regal and Baby Boy Smith, Halloween Havoc. Um, the match alone just blew my mind, even at eight, but the finish of the match, I didn't know what the finish was at the time, but the ending just caught my attention, and it was something that a moment that I wanted to have and to present to people on a daily basis. Um, I started training down in Raleigh, North Carolina with Seymour Snot, the geek with the physique. Um, we train like once a month at the time um, when they had shows for gouge. Then I started training more down in Goldsboro with ATL, my other trainer. Um, I trained for six, seven months before I had my first match with Seymour Snot, and it's been tumbling ever since. Now, you know, you mentioned, first of all, you mentioned a lot of old school guys, man, a lot of people. Like, and for everybody who doesn't know, Tim is still in his, like, early to mid-20s, right? How old are you right now, Tim? I'm 27. Yeah, so Tim's still a, a very young person and stuff, man. Um, mm -hmm. And so you mentioned guys that I grew up watching, Stephen Regal and Davey Boy Smith and Arn Anderson and stuff. Um do you think that watching wrestling with your granddad, obviously watching a lot of what was considered old school wrestling now, do you think that that has molded you into being the kind of wrestler that you are? I'd say so. Um, watching guys like Arn Anderson, Magnum TA, um, Dusty Rhodes, how they would pick up, I guess you would say walking and talking and telling a story with in the ring, and watching guys like Too Cold Scorpio, Fusion Thunder Liger, helped me become more of a, I say, more athletic and to be able to blend both styles together to be somewhat different in this business. Now, you, you mentioned Two Cold Scorpio. Uh, of course, we'll talk about, I'll talk, we'll talk about your match with Two Cold uh, a little later on. But, you know, he was one of those guys who, who really um, was known for being very arrogant, being a, a sloppy, sloppy guy, as what we call it now. Um, how easy was it for you to, how easy was it for you to transfer, to, to get in the wrestling or to use your gymnastics, uh, having a gymnastics background? How easy was it for you to blend gymnastics and professional wrestling? Um, being able that I was doing gymnastics at eight, uh, and seeing guys coming up around in the mid nineties, doing stuff that I did without uh, wrestling before, gymnastic-wise, guys like X-Pop, Jerry Lynn, RVD, Hugo Tu Guerrero, it was very, and especially Tuco Scorpio, it was very interesting seeing guys like myself do things that I could do. And I always wanted to display that when I was growing up, wanting to be a wrestler. Uh, so I think it's cool to be able to... Uh, Blend both styles of my gymnastics background with wrestling. You know, I, I'm telling you, you know, I first my saw you know, like about a year, year and a half, almost two years ago. Um, one of the things that amazed me about you was your complete and total control of your body and stuff, and the way that even in the middle of a, of a flip or whatever, in the middle of a move and stuff, you were able to twist your body in ways that the normal person can't really be, can't really do. Um, how, and of course, with that being with that being said, you come up with a lot of innovative moves, especially you know, 
the shooting star netbreaker, uh your complete variation of Arn Anderson's spine buster. Uh even the way you do your moonsault is completely different than the normal way of doing it. Uh was that a conscious decision on your part or was it just something that came natural to you? I say it came natural to me. Um with wrestling and gymnastics, with the body control and knowing where I am in the air or ground either either war, um I could see things and from other people, I would take things from other people, see what I liked, what I didn't like, and try to either blend in both or say for my spine buster, uh, it's just more so twisting to where I can get them up higher because sometimes I can't pick guys up bigger than me, but if I can manipulate them to where they have to get off their feet a little bit, I can t- twist and turn them to where I need them to be for on my shoulder deal for a spine buster. Moonsaw is just more so getting high up or setting in gymnastics uh, terms. So you know I can get up higher than most people in moonsaults to where, for if you look at it, it's more slower, but it's higher to where it's more impactful. Now, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this whole thing, man, because you're still, we call it green one in this business, man. You've been in the business for what? You've been wrestling for um, almost two years. Am I correct? Yes. Almost two years. And you, the amount of things that you have accomplished in two years is mind-boggling. Um, you know, gouge heavyweight champion for almost for over a year. Um, you know, the the uh, championship to West Virginia, championship to Tennessee, you did the Smoky Mountain Cup, which for somebody with your level of, of experience in the business is almost unheard of. Um, you were slated to be in the Phoenix City Invitational. Um, you know, and then uh, uh, to top it all off, this year you made the PWI 500 uh, at number 500, which in my opinion is the thought outside of the top 100 is the most influential spot on the PWI 500 is, is number 500. Uh, how is it that you accomplish all of this stuff and are able to do all this stuff and still are is still considered to be one of the most humble, uh, thoughtful, nice guys to ever be a professional wrestler? Oh, thank you. Uh, no, but honestly, it's sometimes it doesn't feel real to me. It's like at any moment, you know, you have one of those dreams where everything just seems right, and at the last moment, you just wake up and uh-huh. everything, everything you dreamed of didn't happen. Like sometimes I feel like that's going to happen. I can just reach the top of the plateau in business, in this wrestling business, and just wake up and I have to go to school or something like that. Um, so I just take, I just take. Every moment and relish it because I'm forever. I understand that. I understood that coming in. So I just take every moment, every person I meet, every match I have, um, and make the best of it because you never know when it's your last match. You never know when you have to stop. So as much as I've accomplished, uh, so far in my career, I still want to be, have that feeling of training, like my first day of training, uh, having my first match, having my first match out of state, having my first match against a name, uh, I still have those feelings. It's never one of those days like, oh, I got to wrestle, oh, I got to travel here. It's no, I'm going to New York or I'm going to Indiana to go wrestle and I'm going to have fun. Like, guys, oh, that come up. Sorry? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Sam. Oh, that's okay. Um, I like when people come up to me saying uh, they haven't had a good match in a long time, and then wrestling me, they pulled out things they haven't had. They haven't had a big thing years because of people they had to wrestle. Um, it's just very humbling to be able to pull the best out of people, being still young and still having the same feeling uh, of my first match. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Undisputed Wrestling Show on the Angry March podcast. We're talking to Mr. 500, Timmy Lee Redden. Right now, I will pass it over to my co-host, the bearded wonder, Doc Wonderbeard, Zane Paisley. Zane, what do you have for Tim? Well, uh, once again, Timmy Lee Redden, thank you so much for coming on with us tonight. Um, I've had the opportunity to announce for you a couple times here in Indiana. As uh, Huck has said, uh, great, humble guy. But l- let's let's brag on you for a few minutes. 
you are the gouge champion. Um, you've recently won a, a couple of tournaments, haven't you? Uh, yes, I won. Can you can you start over? I'm, uh, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I won the Le- the PWF Premier Wrestling Federation uh, Legacy Eight Cup um, down in Hubert, North Carolina. That's a promotion Steve Carino uh, runs. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, who were some of your competition in that uh, tournament? Um, I started off wrestling with a guy named Darius Lockhart, who's probably one of the most underrated guys coming up in North Carolina right now. I'd say he's about two or three years wrestling, but he's very hungry, very humble, just as well as me. And I almost lost that match going in the beginning. Um, I was able to uh, defeat him and move on to the next round. And all through uh, matches, I defended my PWF Otani uh, Open Weight Championship that's never been done before. Um, I'm very proud of that as well. My second match, I wrestled Mr. Everything, Victor Andrews. And we almost went to a town to draw. And that was probably my third time wrestling Victor. And every time I wrestled him, we brought the best out of each other. So I was able to defeat him to move on to the finals where I had to wrestle uh, PWS Universal Heavyweight Champion Anthony Ginazzo. And I beat him to retain my championship and also win with the eight cup. Well, that is awesome. Uh, tell, tell some of our listeners that aren't familiar with Gouge, uh, uh, a little bit about Gouge and, and how much fun it is to work there. Gouge is awesome. Um, for people who haven't been there or seen or know what it is, it's basically the southern Chikara in the sense of being family-friendly, um, guys with gimmicks, guys that are very fun to interact with the crowd. Um, and it's funny because sometimes people... I would say downplay gouge because of gimmicks, but the roster that we have for gouge is amazing. Guys like Jimmy Jack Funk Jr., who studied under George South. Um, guys like Mickey Gambino, who's been wrestling for 13 years. He's wrestling in Japan, and he's wrestling in Hawaii. Guys like Otto Franz, uh, he wrestled in WWE, ECW, um, WWF, well, back then before it became WWE, uh, I would say me. Uh, I, I'm not really trying to. I wouldn't put myself in that that league yet. But guys that have been places, guys that have uh, wrestled some of the best in the in the world. Uh, my trainer Seymour Snot. He's wrestled with and uh, trained with guys like John Cena, Christopher Daniels, uh, Frank Kazarian, the great Kali, Bison Smith in California before he moved down to North Carolina. Um, so there's a bunch of guys on that roster that get downplayed because they're gimmicks, but when they go other places, they can wrestle with anybody and have a great match. Uh, so if you are in the area, please come and see Gouge uh, Wrestling in well, Raleigh, North Carolina. And Gouge uh, is an acronym for Gimmicks Only Underground Grappling Entertainment. So, uh, uh, it sounds like a lot of fun. You said that if you're in the area to come on by, the next big show is going to be October 22nd, uh, uh, Malloween. And uh, do you know who you're going to be facing that night? Uh, I will not be there that night. I will be traveling to AML to be in a triple threat with Sean Denny and White Mike. Well, I I want you to put in a word, uh, our, our normal co-host, uh, uh, sign guy is really wanting to get into gouge sometime. Uh, he said that he will be a referee, ring announcer, wrestler, ticket taker, hot dog sales, programs, whatever. So if you can put in a word for our buddy sign guy, we'd appreciate it. I'll definitely do my best. I don't know how much influence I have being a heavyweight champion right now, but I will definitely do my most. Well, uh, Earlier you had mentioned going all around wrestling, New York, Indiana. Um, you know, who's, who's part of your crew that, that you go out with? Um, uh, the most, the set person I have right now is international wrestler Big Bang Ryan Nicole. Hey, Ronnie. Um, right now it's just me and her, but maybe times where I would ride with Joseph McGow, formerly known as Joseph Black, uh, Will Huckabee. Hey, Huck. Um, 
any, like I'll ride with anybody because that's about that's what wrestling's about. Traveling with people, getting to know their stories, getting to know what they go through for wrestling. Um, I haven't really had a set 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 guys that I travel with right now, but right now it's just me and Ronnie. Very nice. Well, what what shows do you have coming up uh, soon? Uh, this weekend I'll be in Mount. Mount Airy for AIWF's uh, show. I was in a ladder match, but due to circumstances outside of negotiations, I will not be in a ladder match, but I will still be there wrestling. Okay. Uh, you know, your your um, background in gymnastics really lends well to your to your wrestling character. I, I love that uh, you've won all these uh, gymnastic cha- championships in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, um, you know, tell us, tell us a little bit about how you, how you came up with that, uh, with those ideas to present yourself in that way. Well, when I first started training, uh, Seymour asked me, um, what did I want to present myself in the business? And at the time, I didn't really know because going around the mid Atlantic, there was more guys just being themselves. Uh, I didn't really get into gouge. I started with gouge, but I didn't really embrace gals when I first started I was just still learning who I was as a wrestler not more so as uh, a gimmick wrestler uh, I was training one night and Mickey Gambino he had showed up to come train and I was just doing gymnastics in the ring uh, tumbling and he had pitched the idea to Seymour and Seymour gave me the idea and I just been running with it ever since because it's more so still being myself just in a different avenue where people haven't seen something like that before. I can do things I've been doing since I was eight and still present it as wrestling. And it grabs people's attention and wants them to see more of me and know how I'm able to do that with wrestling and make it work. So what did you uh, think of the uh, Olympics this past year, specifically the gymnastics competitions? Oh, I thought it was amazing. Um, the girls did amazing this year. Uh, the guys did great. Uh, it was very representative of the U.S., and I'm proud of everybody all around. Excellent, excellent. Um, now, I know at uh, Intense Championship Wrestling in, in Marion, Indiana, I've seen you uh, work with the great Cheyenne, and uh, what what are your thoughts about when the promoter asks you to uh, work with a woman doing a, an intergender match? I have no problem with it. Wrestling is wrestling. Um, I treat every, uh, everyone equally, male, female, uh, monkey, horse, uh, anybody, because we get in the ring, we do the exact same thing. We can get hurt equally. We take the same risks. So I believe every person deserves that amount of respect, as long as you're trained. Um, when the promoter said I was wrestling Great Cheyenne, I was thrilled because I know wrestling – with Ronnie, and she would tell me stories of how amazing Grace Cheyenne was in the ring. I knew it'd be a great contest, and I'm very proud of our match. Well, you, you should be proud, but it, in that instance, you were you were uh, the baby face. You were the good guy in the in the match, and Cheyenne, uh, I've only seen her work as the bad guy. You know, is it hard for as as a man to uh, stay uh, the good guy during the match role uh, when you're wrestling a woman? I mean, in a sense, because as much as I respect her, I still want to win because I still want to be in the top caliber to where I can win championships and make more money. But it presents itself because given today's age, there are still people who will wag their finger at energy matches. And I don't want to come across as a woman beater, if I guess you would say. But at the end of the day, I'm still trying to win. So... I try my best to wrestle her, not so much hit her. Yeah, I, this was a couple months ago, but I, I remember the match, and it was you did a great job of uh, of trying to uh, be the gentleman and, until she basically made you fight her uh, and, and not just be a wrestling match. I, I thought you did a great job, so that that's one of the reasons why I brought it up tonight. All right, I, uh, this is the Undisputed Wrestling Show on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. You can check us out at www.theundisputedwrestlingshow.weebly.com and of course on the Angry Marks Podcast Network if you go to Angry Marks 
dot com and click the little podcast tab. You can uh, check out a bunch of great shows every week. I am going to be passing along to the incredible Huck, Will Huckabee. Will, what else do you have for Timmy Lou Redden? Um, you know, I, I, I really want to get into this and stuff. Speaking of, you know, great matches and everything, um, a little while ago, you had the chance to, to rep the one of your idols, man, Tico Scorpio. Uh, and not only that, but to get some advice from him. What was it like wrestling one of your childhood heroes, man? Was it everything you expected? Because, of course, we all know the saying, you never meet your heroes because they never live up to the hype in person. But for you, how was it wrestling Too Cold Scorpio? Uh, what kind of advice did he give you? And do y'all still stay in contact? Well, first meeting him, I was able to induct him into the High Volume Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame down in Kinston, North Carolina. Um, I drove him around. I picked his brain for hours. He was everything I hoped for plus more with information, telling me stories about guys in WCW, how he wrestled in Japan, wrestling in Germany, and just being someone that looks like me and represents me because besides being an African-American uh, wrestler, he was a guy that, for his size, he was he was way, he's so ahead in his time. And still, at he's 50. He's 50. I need you guys to understand when I say that. He is 50. And still doing the things that he was doing back in his, I guess, heyday, people would say, is amazing. Um, when I got the news I was wrestling him, I was amazed. I was shocked. But I wasn't scared. Guys would ask me, are you nervous? No, I'm not nervous. As times went closer to the match, I was getting a little nervous. Uh, got someone, uh, he's going to hit you real hard. I mean, I understand that. I didn't understand how hard it was going to hit me until the match started. Um, I would say the first seven minutes of the match, it was just nerves, hands shaking, getting to feel out for each other. And I was nervous wrecked until you punched me in the mouth. Then after that, <laughs> then after that, it was just ball to wall the entire match. And the next night, I felt like I got in a car accident because my body, everything on me was sore. My neck, my head, uh, my legs, my chest, everything was sore. But it was one of those good, those good pains. Like, you know, you gave everything in that match. Um, and he was just telling about how stuff like that happens every time in Japan. Like, he told, he told me, I'm going to wrestle you like we're in Japan because he knows one of my goals is to wrestle in Japan one day. And it was strong style the entire time. And he hit me. I hit my hardest. And he just looked at me like I need to hit harder. And I'm not saying I'm scared, but it's just one of those things where, all right, I got to throw everything in that one elbow or that one punch or that one kick. And towards the end, the more I hit him, the more he was smiling. And the more he was smiling, the more... I felt like I was going to die that night. But <laughs> after the match, he shook my hand, gave me a hug, and he said, you are well on your way to being in Japan. Um, we still talk every once in a while when he's back in the States because he wrestles a lot around the world and normally in Canada. But every time I get a chance to talk to him or ask him to watch my matches, store critiques, um, just see how he's doing, how's his family, he'll ask me the same. Um, but it's very... It was very humbling, very outer body experience. Now, you, besides two cold stuff here, man, this is a list of people off the top of my off the top of my head that I, that I could think of that you've wrestled. Um, you know, besides, besides two cold Scorpio, you know, you got Joe Fagal, you and Joe always tear it up. Uh, T.W. Anderson, Jason Kincaid, Chase Owens, Jack Dane. Um, I mean, am I, am I forgetting anybody? I mean, you basically wrestled such a wide range of, of talent. Um, and have been able to hold your own when it, when it comes to wrestling. Uh, last week we had the great Cheyenne and, and the great Malachi on the show and Malachi made a comment about you, uh, saying that he was amazed that a guy your size could move the way you move and as agile as you are. Um, with all the list of guys that you've wrestled with, you've shared the ring with so far. Is there anybody on the Indies right now. We're not going to talk about WWE or TNA or, or Japan or anything, or all age. Is there anybody that's, 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 caught, that's working the Indies right now uh, that you would love to step in the ring with? There's a few. Um, I don't really have a list like most guys do. It's just 
because I want to wrestle everybody. That's how you get better. You wrestle the best to become better. You wrestle the not so good to learn from mistakes to be better. So I don't really have a list. If but if I had to choose anybody, I would choose Tommy End. You choose who? Tommy End. Oh, why that? I feel like with my style, it'd be so different from his because he's more smash mouth. I'm more of showmanship. I can still get down and dirty if I need to. I feel like it'd be a good contrast of wrestling styles. Now, now, Zane, before I, I take my next to ask my next question, I've got to tell you, if you follow, uh, you'll, you'll follow Tim on social media, you're friends with him on Facebook or whatever. Uh, Tim is always on Facebook talking about going to training. He's always inviting guys to come and train with him. Uh, to come, you know, work out and stuff in the ring and everything. Um, which for a guy, his, his amount of business, his amount of time in the business is a very, is very rare for somebody to say, hey, look, it's Tuesday. We're going to be in the ring. Anybody wants to, if anybody wants to show up, show up. You know what I'm saying? Um, for you, Tim, you know, uh, how do you, you know, working your regular shoot job? And I'm not going to say it out here. If you want to sit there about what you do for a living, you can. But, Daily life, you know, talk to promoters, setting up bookings and everything. How do you find the time to go to the gym, to go to training, you know, and to put in the quality amount of, of time that you need in each to consistently get better? Well, with my profession as a gymnastic coach down in Raleigh, North Carolina, I have more of a flexible schedule to where I can do my job and then go train or go work out. Um, I know guys that go to school, they work nine to five, they have kids, and they'll still find some time to do some training. Not Even if it's not a lot, it's still something to where they're progressing conditioning-wise to stay in shape and be better. Um, there's just more guys that I, I know near me that have more free time that would rather play video games or rather go out and have socialized, and I'm not knocking any of that whatsoever, but if you tell me, and if we're talking, and you're saying, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, and I'm asking, what are you doing to obtain that uh, that goal or that dream, and there's no effort behind it, I can't really take your goal seriously, because there's a bunch of guys that I know that I first started with, they're not wrestling anymore. And they're messaging me every so often and say, oh, hey, I can't wait to get back in it. Uh, I can't wait to uh, come out and hang out with you to uh, wrestle some more. But the next week or the time I'm offering, hey, I got seats. Uh, that's one of the drives that we go to shows. Even if you're not on the show, you can still network. And sometimes you never know, a guy might not show up. I'll get excuse after excuse after excuse to a point where I just said, okay, I'm done. Um, when Ronnie had left to go to Japan and wrestle, I had three seats available for those six months. I can, on one hand, I can tell you how many guys offered to come with me or drive with me or meet with me to go to shows. And it got to a point where I was like, okay, I'll drive myself. And now, then I was, now, Ryan, now, I was going to, I'm about to say, I hate to cut you off because I was going to say, you know, you're talking about doing the drives and stuff and me and you are both members uh of the, the brutal bobs doing the drives club. Um for for guys like us it's not just a hashtag, it's it's what we live and breathe. It's hey, yo, I'm gonna get in the car and I'm going to these shows. And I remember when I first met you stuff and, and the advice. I was, you remember the advice I first gave you the first time I met you? Yes. So, please tell the world the advice I gave you. Zane, you're gonna love me. All right. Basically when you met me and I was asking you how could I get better he was telling me I have to put in the work, meaning I have to go to shows, sometimes not getting nothing, sometimes just getting a handshake. But doing that in the long run help, will help me much more than not going to shows, not going. I would go to shows knowing that I wasn't booked. I would go just to go help, just to go to promote Hey, I'm Tim. Um, I'm here. I have my gear. If you need anything, I'm uh, running gear to the back, uh, ringing the bell, um, being a referee. I'm here if you need me. And I can't tell you how many bookings I got off from doing that. Um, it's just putting in the work. 
putting in the work and just going no matter what because at the end of the day, if it's your dream, you'll do whatever it takes to obtain it. Exactly. And you taking the the motto of doing the drives and going out there and getting your name out there, uh, especially, you know, when you're still very green in this business, it's about getting exposure and getting ring time and stuff. Uh, you taking that and took it to a, an entirely different level. Uh, when, when you put your Facebook or when you see someone, when, to you, what does doing the drives mean? It's like this, hey, hashtag doing the drives. What does that mean to Timmy Lee Wright? Getting people in a car, driving an extreme amount of hours, talking, hanging out, learning each other's background, uh, just for that moment. Because people outside of wrestling think that, oh, it's glamorous or it's like bright lights or stuff they see in WWE. It's not. It's, it's hard. It's extremely hard, especially the, especially the goals that you want to attain. It's really hard trying to reach those goals because sometimes either bookers won't book you, uh, shows cancel, uh, need had to try to hustle to get another show. Um, the car can break down. I remember driving back from a show with me and Ronnie, and there were so many tolls. We were coming from New York. I used all the pay I had from that show just to get out of New York. Then we had one more toll, and then we were home. We had to literally pull on the side of the road, look for change in the floorboard just to get enough money to get past that toll. But from that show, I had seven more shows lined up. It's a sacrifice, but if you're looking, if you're willing to sacrifice everything for it, there's a payout from it. It may not be the amount you want, but it can also lead to different things, opportunities, matches, uh, venues, uh, championship experiences, stuff like that. So doing the job for me is sacrificing everything for that one moment. All right, so one, one more question before I pass it back to Zane. Um, do you mind being labeled as a 50 guy? As a what? Do you mind being labeled as a flippy guy? And what do you have to say to your detractors who think that you have attained too much too soon? Um, I guess you could say I'm a flippy guy, given that my gimmick is I do flips. Um, I don't feel like I've getting I've gotten things too soon because I've seen guys with less have more of a an ego than a guy that's been world champion five times. Um, I feel that opportunities that I've gotten have become because of risks I've taken, um, sacrifices that I've given up. Because I've, as much as I've lost, I've gained as well. I've lost friends. I've lost moments, times, memories, uh, family members that don't help me anymore because I've missed things because of wrestling. But I, I quote this a lot, and I feel like it's the epitome of me in wrestling. It's like my life is based off sacrifices because I've given almost everything to this business right now, and only in two years. I, just imagine what I'm willing to do now that I'm getting more exposure for my sacrifices. I'll do as much as I can, as long as I can for the business. So for my detractors... Come watch me wrestle. Come to a show. Um, not, if anything you heard bad, it's wrong. Just give elegance a chance. Well, Tim, I'm a look, man. It's been great talking to you. I'm gonna pass it back to Zay, uh, because I know Zay has a couple last questions for you. Stuff. I know our time with you is running short, but I'm de- You know, I'm definitely gonna see you in the next upcoming weeks and stuff, man. I can't wait to hang out, and cheer together, uh, give somebody the double drop kick gimmick. You know what I'm talking about. Once again, this is the Undisputed Wrestling Show on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. We are talking to uh, wrestling's only gymnast and Mr. 500 for PWI. Now, we've alluded to it a couple times, but, you know, how did you find out about being number 500? On uh, for Pro Wrestling Illustrated for the year 2016. Uh, it was it's a funny story actually. Um, I was asleep because I had just got back out of town from uh was it New York wrestling, and my friend Elliot Russell from the Heat Seekers. Hello, uh, Elliot. Um, he messaged me saying, 
uh, congratulations, Bubba. Uh, you made it to the 500. And I'm still groggy and still tired, so I look at it. And I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. And then go back to sleep. Hmm. Uh, three hours, <laughs> three hours later, I wake up to a bunch of messages, a bunch of text messages, uh, Facebook messages, Twitter, uh, Instagram, people congratulate me. And I'm like, what did I do? And I'm just looking at it and it shows that I made it to 500. And it's just weird because growing up, I used to watch, I used to read it. I had stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of magazines from PWI. And to even be mentioned in it is overwhelming to be in the five, like the 500 is, is breathtaking because I know some of the guys that have been 500 and gone on to do great things. Guys like Space Monkey, guys like Rido, uh, guys like Nick Nemeth or Dolph Ziggler. Uh, so to be in that category and to people to know me because I'm the last person, uh, the first and last person PWI 500, uh, they could remember because it's easy. So as most people will say, oh, you're fine. You you barely made it. But, yeah, I barely did. But <laughs> I'm in there, and I'll use it as much as I can because like I, said, I didn't expect any of this, really. Um, I didn't expect to wrestle. Like My only goal in wrestling when I first started was to not be bad at it. And for the fact that I'm doing all this stuff and experiencing all this stuff, it's still a dream come true to me. So it's just amazing. Yeah, that is awesome. Now, Will, what what was your ranking? Um, I was number three ninety five, so I was one hundred five spots above them. Um, and then <laughs> Joe was like three eighty eight, I think. All right, but as as you, we just demonstrated, I knew that you were five hundred. I knew that Will was in the three hundreds, but I couldn't remember the exact number. So maybe it's oh. Now, uh. Uh, Timmy, was I the first one that was able to announce you uh, as Mr. 500? Yes, yes, I were. Awesome. So, so when you're a big time star in the WWE, you'll remember me and get me free tickets, right? <laughs> I don't. Hopefully, I'll be lucky to get tickets myself. So, if I can get one, I'll be sure to put a name in for you. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Will had mentioned your social media earlier. Can you give us uh, what all you're on and what your handle is? Um, yes, um, my Facebook page, I have a fan page, Timmy Lou Retton. Uh, I have a Twitter account, at Timmy Lou Retton. And I also have an Instagram, at, you guessed it, Timmy Lou Retton. Uh, for bookers, promoters that want to uh, book me for the shows, it's fcgm.1988 at gmail.com. I have t-shirts on prowrestling.com. Um, please type in Timmy Lou Retton. They're under the PWS banner, but I will be having sh- shirts for my own page coming up, including Mr. 500. Um, I have more shirts called the Tumbling Dead shirt. They're very popular. Um, I'm hoping to get some more pushed out soon. Um, anytime you want to come see me, please, or see my matches, I, they're on YouTube, and which is cool as in itself because I never expect people wanting to watch me wrestle. Um but, yeah, thank you guys for having me so much. I had a fun time. Well, uh, before we let you go, is there anything that you need to uh, say to your fans listening? Um, thank you, guys. First and foremost, I never expected to have fans. Um, so thank you guys that are interested in me. Uh, for my family, thank you for supporting me for day one. Thank you to my sister, Tiffany, for letting me be my test dummy growing up. Um, thank you to my cousins, uh, my mom, my first real supporter, uh, my friends that have sacrificed and understood me not coming to their big events because of my shows, uh, promoters that have given me chances, uh, based solely off of first my trainer, Seymour, Seymour. Thank you so much for taking a chance on me when guys that wouldn't, that told me I wouldn't make anything out of myself in this business. Um, thank you, Will, for the advice. Thank you, Joseph. A gal for putting me under his wing and taking me to shows and helping me. Thank you, Alton, for helping me put in myself for wrestling. Um, thank you to the vets that helped me, that critiques my matches and tell me the brutal truth that I need to hear to be better. Um, just thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody in wrestling, outside of wrestling. Uh, thank you, Brutal Bob Evans, for testing me and making me become 
a complete wrestler, even though I'm not complete yet. Um, I'm trying my best to be one. That's, that's all. Thank, thank you. Well, thank you, Timmy Lou Retton. We appreciate you coming on.